welcome everyone and um, thank you Arif and thank you Arif for um, Arif Zaman for organizing uh, this event and, and this series. Um, it's a really important development for the Institute of Commonwealth Studies. And we're gonna start with uh, an issue which is, has very much been in the news recently, the Africa Free Trade Area, which was uh, agreed back in 2018, but finally came into existence on the 1st of January uh, this year, 2021, um, 54 of the 55 African Union nations have signed the agreement, which will affect over 1.2 billion people with a combined GDP of two trillion pounds. Um, the signatories are required to remove tariffs from around 90% of goods and uh, the UN Economic Commission for Africa estimates that the agreement will boost intra-Africa intra trade by over 50% by 2022. So this is a, a huge development for uh, Commonwealth countries in Africa and other African nations. And so it's a, it's a great place to start with the first of what we hope will be a regular series of, of seminars on the Commonwealth and business. And this is maybe an area that we haven't looked at as an institute, the Institute of Commonwealth Studies in great detail before. Um, and we hope to look at a range of different issues over the, the next few months and hopefully years, including things like um, Commonwealth markets, the so-called Commonwealth advan advantage, um, the role of women and uh, young people and diasporas in uh, trading patterns. And we want to bring together, as we, as we do in the Institute always, not just academics, but also um, policy, make policy makers and stakeholders from a range of different organizations. Um, and uh, so, uh, we have a, a, a fantastic team of, of experts uh, gathered together to give their views on this. Uh, what we'll do, Arif will, will take over in a minute and uh, introduce our speakers, um, who will say a few words um, to, to start off with. Um, they will then discuss the issues amongst themselves and uh, we'll take questions um, at the end. Um, please do, if you're not speaking, I'm sure you all know the, the, the Zoom protocols very well by now. If you're not speaking, please keep your, your microphones on mute. Um, if you uh, would like to ask a question, please uh, pose your question in the chat function. Um, and if you, if you want to kind of to, to come on screen and, and ask the question in person, uh, let us let us know. Uh, we will be recording this session and we'll broadcast it um, on our website with the permission of uh, participants. But thank you all so much for, for joining us to discuss this very important issue. And without further ado, I'll hand over to Arif, uh, Arif Zaman, who's recently joined the Institute of Commonwealth Studies uh, to a PhD with us. Um, who will introduce our speakers. So thank you, Arif. Thank you. I think I should start by thanking my wife because without her, I'm not sure I'd be doing my PhD with her agreement, let alone blessing. Um, so th thank you very much, Philip, and um, thank you for all for joining today. And I think it's been tremendous, actually, to see the Institute um, initiate this series and, and bring people together in the way we are today. And I think this is the first time, unless I'm mistaken, and I'm sure others will correct me if I am, but and there have been a number of um, events recently around um, and about Africa and the free trade area. I think this is the first to talk about it within within the Commonwealth in the context of how does this relate to broader developments in the Commonwealth. Of course, this, of course, is a very important moment for the Commonwealth, um, not just because the um, 
uh, the chair of the Commonwealth 24 hours ago um, announced that um, it'll be, well, business as usual on June the 21st. I'm not sure whether Brendan, he thought about the Chogham week when he made that comment or not, if there was a cause and effect. But in any case, we're, we're beginning to see, um, you know, greater confidence um, amongst a number of countries in that in the context of the pandemic, but clearly in relation to what happened in the UK on January the 1st, that date exactly coincided with the um, um, operational, or uh, the implementation, I should say, of the African free trade area. Um, and in fact, this month, there have now, I think, 36 member states that have ratified um, the African free trade area. Um, practically every Commonwealth country um, that's in Africa. Um, and I think they were amongst also the first to um, to ratify. So I think that's been an important um, development. I'm just going to make just no more than, um, you know, just a few very brief opening comments, and then we'll pass immediately to um, the panel that I'm delighted that we've been able to bring together from um, London, as well as Nairobi and, and elsewhere. Um, so very pleased to have people with us today. So let me just, um, just say, um, let me just begin rather by by just making the point that I think in relation to um, um, Africa, it, it is a signature moment, I think. I mean, not just because, and I was thinking about this, you know, a bit earlier. I mean, I think the signal that this sends, the very fact that the agreement came into force on the very day that, you know, you could say that on one level, the world's, um, you know, biggest trading bloc, the European Union, became by definition smaller on the very day that the largest group came into being. Um, that doesn't rest, underestimate the challenges, but I think there are, um, it's important also to realize that Africa is in the move in different directions. I mean, yes, in terms of intra-African developments, but also outward. I mean, if you look at African startups outside the continent, um, in fact, just um, um, recently, we had South Africa's internet startup company, NASPERS, listed um, its global process on the Euro next exchange in Amsterdam. Um, in fact, they're now Europe's biggest internet company. Uh, we've seen investments um, um, elsewhere as well in other directions. Nigeria, Eroka TV um, is planning to list on the London Stock Exchange within the next uh, 12 months. Um, and he plans to raise, you know, over $30 million. So there is, there are developments um, in the continent, but also on African countries looking outside as well. And I think that, that points to sort of some of the realities that are that are taking shape. Um, one of the people who had listed on the program that wasn't able to join us, I believe he's he's literally in transit while we speak. Um, but um, um, Philip, he's a SOAS um, alumnus, so he's part of our University of London community. Um, uh, His Excellency Wam Mene, the um, African um, um, Free Trade Area Secretary General, um, was actually in transit um, as we speak, I believe, in Accra. But uh, to, something that he said recently, I just want to briefly read from that, because I think that also paints a useful context from um, from um, the AU and the African, the African Union and African Free Trade Agreement. Um, Friedrich Arian, what he said was the following, quote, aspirations of over half a century are now being realized through the imminent start of trading under the preferential terms of the African continental free trade area. This heralds a new chapter in Africa's development of cooperation through trade to drive economic and social transformation. Importantly, Africa agreement explicitly seeks to benefit women and youth, as well as small and medium scale enterprises, who all predominate economic activity in African countries. Recovery from the contractions associated with the COVID-19 pandemic is hinged on inter-African trade. Shortened global supply chains can translate into increased levels of production of goods and services in Africa led by African enterprises. Increased production will lead to stable business growth, which can contribute to the revenue bases of African governments. Crucially, Africa's producing and trading enterprises will create the jobs needed by Africa's workforce. These enterprises will thus drive Africa's economic transformation and the improvements in social conditions and well-being. And, and that's the end of the quote. And I think it's important to anchor it in that context. I mean, he, he talked there about the importance of um, inclusive growth. He talked about women and youth and, sm and small, medium-sized enterprises. He talked about the relevance and the resonance of this agreement given um, COVID when clearly the discussions that led to water agreement predated clearly predated COVID, but in terms of the current context, I think, you know, clearly this um, increased ability to work together um, and fi find ways in which business can be 
um, supported and 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 economies can grow is going to be critically important. Um, not least given you know obviously we've seen areas like tourism particularly affected in Africa and other areas as well as international travel really doesn't look to be resuming. In fact, I saw recently IATA and I used to work. For a number of years and my sins for British Airways as their global market and industry analyst. And we always used to say in British Airways that a good early indicator of economic trade was um, Brendan high value trade, so air cargo was a very good early indicator. And all of the prognosis on air cargo is pretty awful right now, really. But they're talking about 2025 being the earliest in terms of resumption to 2019 traffic levels, which gives a context, I think, for this um, at this moment. So let me um, stop there and let me just pass immediately over. So what, what I propose to do in terms of the, um, the batting order, stick with the cricket um is to, to is to go through pretty much as you see it on as, as posted on the on the event notice so we're going to start um with um uh, dr brendan vickers um uh, to talk about um the commonwealth and um, the commonwealth perspective on what's happening in the african free trade area and broader developments that um, he may then wish to draw upon uh, we'll then proceed um to frank um frank Marsat, um from trademark east africa who's joining us I believe live from nairobi um, and then Karishma Banga from the Overseas Development Institute. Um, and then we'll proceed um, to Dr. Namdi Medici um, um, from Bloomsbury Institute um, and uh, Dr. Uh, Robert Evo Hinson from the University of Ghana. And that's the plan. I should also just say that this event coincides with the Department for International Trade, which is convening Africa Week. And, and that just highlights the point that there is a whole series, and there is a link if you haven't seen it or you know you want to know more about it. If you follow the event notice, there's a link to that. You can register. There is a whole set of events, all three you can participate in. You can network with businesses um, and others that are looking to increase links between the UK um, and Africa. Uh, goes on for the whole of this week, uh, Africa Week, um, which follows on the um, on the Prime Minister's investment African Investment Summit in January. So with that having been said, let me pass to, um, to Dr. Brendan Vickers. Uh, Dr. Vickers is economic advisor in the Trade Oceans and Natural Resources Directorate at the Commonwealth Secretariat in London. He was previously head of research and policy in the South African Department of Trade and Industry. He also worked in the non-governmental sector. Um, and uh, he's also had positions at the Institute for Global Dialogue and the Faber Mbiki African uh, Leadership Institute. He's published widely on a range of, um, of issues and was author of a handbook on regional integration in Africa towards Agenda 2063 in 2017 and contributed to the um, to the Commonwealth Trade Review. And in fact, the, the, the current one is in process now. I'm not sure if the um, ink is dry yet, Brendan, or it's still drying, but um, uh, we, we, we're delighted to have you here. And I, I think Philip and I are particularly delighted, and uh, we'd be very remiss if we not to mention this, um, that he is an uh, uh, Institute for Commonwealth Studies alumnus. So this is life. Um, this is this is demonstration, Brendan. Perhaps to me as well that there is life after the uh, there is life after the after the journey. Um, I'll tell that to my wife later. Um, so Brendan, um, over to you, and, and a very warm welcome to you. Thanks, Arif, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, recognise Philip as the director. Indeed, I'm an alumnus of the institute, and. Um, um, you know, I've come, 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 come full circle in a way. I had a Commonwealth scholarship to study a PhD at the Institute of Commonwealth Studies and then moved on to work at the Commonwealth Secretariat, um, having been in South Africa uh, at the Ministry of Trade. Um, so thanks for this opportunity. Um, it also coincides actually with preparations that are well underway for Chagam in Rwanda. Uh, this afternoon we had a briefing uh, from Kigali about all the preparations that are being done. Uh, for the forums as well. And this week, we'll also have the open-ended working groups to look at some of the deliverables for Chogham. Uh, one of those deliverables, uh, not formally, but that uh, will animate and hopefully contribute to some of the discussions and debates around Chogham is our 2021 Commonwealth Trade Review. Uh, and um, so I'm going to be drawing a bit of uh, you know, the findings from that review to set the global picture, to also understand the African picture and how Commonwealth uh, countries are using, you know, uh, the African continent and the, F the FDA as a springboard to greater global competitiveness. Uh, and the focus of the review will be on COVID-19 and the impact that has had on trade and investment in the Commonwealth. Um, I'd also draw your attention to a really uh, excellent briefing, which my colleague Hilary Inos-Edu did on 
the African continental free trade area and how it builds resilience and contributes to economic recovery. So that's on the Secretariat's webpage on trade. I put together a few slides just to, um, uh, to visualize some of the data that we have. So I'm just gonna pull that up and I hope that everyone can see that. Great, great. So um, yeah, I'm really drawing just on update on intra Commonwealth trade and the significance of the continental FDA. Uh, so why is this important? Just uh, expand it like that. So why is this important? Because we know that, uh, you know, we're in the decade of implementation of the sustainable development goals. We only have around eight years left and trade is indispensable for achieving those sustainable development goals. And we've already missed some of the targets. If we think about the, um, the, 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 the target to double the share of LDCs in global trade by the end of 2020, that has been missed. And we know that there's a more challenging global trade landscape due to COVID-19. Uh, but in 2018, our heads of government adopted the intra-commonwealth trade target of reaching $2 trillion by 2030. This is really going to require proactive policy measures for a more sustainable and resilient economic recovery, given the extremely challenging outlook over the next few years, uh, particularly for those services dependent small island developing states that depend so much on travel and tourism. Uh, the reason why I say this also is that intra Commonwealth trade is largely regional. So the continental FDA is really an important pivot for trade and economic recovery of our 19 Commonwealth African member countries. And Africa is the biggest group within the Commonwealth. So um, you know, these, this is a significant share of our membership. Just taking one step back and say that the Commonwealth Secretariat has provided substantial support over many years uh, at the regional and the continental levels to support economic integration in the continent. Uh, one of our flagship programs has been the Hubs and Spokes Trade Advisors which um, we've placed at the African Union Commission and also at various regional economic communities. But I think the uh, advisors at the African Union Commission really stand out in terms of the role they've played in supporting uh, African member countries, Commonwealth and non-Commonwealth to negotiate the continental free trade area. Uh, but more importantly, also to support the development of policies to take advantage of the, tax, uh, the actual preferences and benefits that are likely to flow from the continental free trade area. So um, not only in the trade space, but also looking at strategies around digital trade, um, uh, you know, the, the oceans economy, a commodity strategy for the continent and so forth. So if we look at a little bit the data, uh, and this is drawing from some of the work around our Commonwealth trade review, uh, it's very clear that the pandemic has dealt a serious blow to intra-Commonwealth trade. Uh, so we see that in 2019, the value of intra-commonwealth trade goods and services was around 670 billion US dollars. Uh, and when we looked at the GDP projections for 2020, uh, you know, we estimated that that would grow to around 704 uh, billion in challenging times, given the slowdown of the Indian economy, given uncertainty around Brexit, uh, you know, given uh, trade tensions and technology wars between the US and China. Uh, but when we actually see in COVID how growth has been affected across the Commonwealth, that estimate is down to just under uh, just uh, just just under six hundred and forty billion dollars. So that's a sixty five billion dollar hit in a single year to intra Commonwealth trade, and that's going to be significant. Um, it's mainly goods trade. Commonwealth trade is mainly in commodities and goods. Uh, but we we do see is that uh, intra Commonwealth services trade is higher than the global average. The global average is around 25%. Uh, Intra-Commonwealth trade is 35%. And we know that services, particularly travel, transport, and tourism have been heavily hit. Uh, so that will have an impact. Um, if we break it down by our uh, in levels of analysis that we use in a way, whenever we um, analyze intra-Commonwealth trade, we use this format, which is perhaps useful for students and researchers working in this area and, and want to contribute we look at the pan Commonwealth level and then we break it down to developed and developing regions and uh, specifically to highlight the um, Caribbean and Pacific small island developing states within that. Uh, but if we look see that developing countries took the biggest hit, $45 billion loss uh, estimated that is led by Asia, um, you know, the most populous and most dynamic region when it comes to trade at 35 billion and Africa at 7.5 billion. Um, but in relative terms, you can see that the Caribbean small island developing states were heavily affected. Um, 
that's around a 25% blow to the trade flows as a result of the pandemic. So um, particularly East Caribbean and Pacific SIDS are going to need considerable support uh, to rev revive their economies. If we look at the top 10 intra-commonwealth exporters and how they were affected, uh, we can see that um, you know, India took the biggest hit at around a loss of 17% estimates in, uh, in trade, uh, followed by some of the, you know, the other big countries, particularly the United Kingdom and Malaysia. Um, and this just shows you how you know, the, the, you know, the top, top exporters have been affected, including uh, Bangladesh, which comes in a 10th place, not as much affected. Um, and that's an interesting case study to look at, uh, particularly from a uh, perspective of the garments and the textiles manufacturing industry, where uh, women play an important part in the production process there. Turning to Africa. Uh, yeah, as I said, it's our biggest uh, biggest grouping in the Commonwealth, 19 members. We also know that Africa is home to most of the world's least developed countries, uh, and so it's faced significant challenges, particularly for the landlocked least developed countries, including our incoming chair, Rwanda. Uh, and I think the story here is really interesting. When it comes to intra-African trade, uh, Af uh, Commonwealth African members really drive this trade. We say around two-thirds of goods and services are contributed by our Commonwealth member countries. Um, you know, that in, in a way that's intuitive. Um, you know, the, the, the biggest Commonwealth countries in Sub-Saharan Africa are South Africa, Nigeria, Kenya, are big drivers of trade and investment. But if we look at 2019, the value of intra-African trade was 84 billion US dollars of which the Commonwealth's 19 countries counted for 52 billion. Um, so that's quite significant in that regard and raises questions around who's going to benefit the most from the trade agreement and what measures need to be put in place to cushion uh, the impact on others and ensure that there's an equitable sharing of the benefits. Uh, looking a little bit at the foreign direct investment picture as well, here we've used the data from the Financial Times uh, to let, look specifically at greenfield investment. Greenfield investment is productive investment. It's new factories, new buildings, it creates jobs. It's a kind of investment that can contribute substantially to the achievement of the SDGs. And again, there's a really compelling story here over the past decade that if we look at the investments, 70% of that among intra-African investment has come from Commonwealth countries as the sources. Uh, and we just pulled out the two last years, 2019 and 2020, where you see um, the, the, the top three investors basically rotating, but they are South Africa, Mauritius, and Nigeria. Uh, and significantly, if you look at the job creation by these announced greenfield projects, uh, over those two years, um, these three countries have basically contributed to 11,000 jobs in Africa. And we hope that the FDA will catalyze further investment, more productive investment, uh, and investment that contributes to structural economic transformation across the African continent. So my final slide is just, you know, what does this mean from the perspective of the Commonwealth? Uh, and we see the African market, uh, you know, more than a billion people as a massive consumer market with considerable potential to stimulate intra-regional trade in manufactured goods, food products and services, drawing on the continent's abundance of sustainability, land, water, solar. Increasingly, we're talking about the circular economy uh, and how we can ensure sustainability principles and those circular economy principles are embedded into production and trade. Also bearing in mind that production and trade are increasingly data-driven, uh, drawing on the fourth industrial revolution. So we see immense potential here. Uh, but Overall, you know, one has to go beyond tariffs. You know, the continental FDA is very much about uh, providing preferences through tariff reduction. Uh, tariffs aren't the biggest hindrance in Africa. They are more substantial stumbling blocks. Uh, and this is why many African countries and have embarked on the idea of uh, you know, developmental regionalism and developmental integration. That trade is important and tariffs are important, but they have to go hand in hand with a focus on productive capacity, structural economic transformation, in other words, particularly through regional value chains. Uh, and we've done some work on the leather and leather product sector, showing the benefits from just removing non-tariff barriers um, to catalyze more than two billion worth of intra-commonwealth trade in Africa in these sectors, but also infrastructure and finance to connect power and digitalize the continent. And the African Union has just uh, launched a fund which shows that uh, you know, the funding gap for infrastructure is significant, almost 60 to $90 billion, and that needs to be overcome. 
So bringing it all together, uh, because we're the Commonwealth, we focus on this through the lens of the Commonwealth advantage. This says that there are inherent trade and investment benefits to being a Commonwealth member, even though the Commonwealth isn't a trading block. We attribute this to a number of factors, shared history, uh, you know, the use of English as a common language for conducting commerce, familiar legal and administrative systems that uh, make conducting business easier, uh, familiar in, in many ways, uh, and also large and dynamic diasporas. And we keep on looking and trying to examine further aspects of this advantage, but uh, it can come down to a number of factors that could complement the implementation of the continental free trade area. Uh, the first is to reduce trade costs. We've found that when two Commonwealth countries trade with each other as a bilateral pair, trade costs are 19% lower uh, than they would be compared to non-Commonwealth countries. Our most recent estimates now take this to around 21% for the, for the latest edition of the trade review. We know that uh, this Commonwealth connection boosts trade. We found that Commonwealth countries tend to trade 20% more with each other than, com uh, than non-Commonwealth countries. That's remained relatively stable. Uh, but the uh, possibility of bringing in digital trade, particularly through the next phase of negotiations for the trade agreement, could really boost that. Thirdly, is to attract foreign direct investment. The Commonwealth advantage here has grown from 10% to almost tripling to tw uh, 27%. Um, and it's really significant if one pulls out greenfield investment. If you look at the advantages there, African countries attract around 37% more greenfield investment from within the Commonwealth than they would from non-Commonwealth partners. And this is significant in the African case, really stands out. It's almost 18% above the Commonwealth average. Uh, to strengthen trade governance is the fourth, particularly around addressing uh, you know, red tape and non-tariff barriers. We've done a simulation which shows that if you reduce red tape for exporters by 10%, intra-Commonwealth trade goes up around 5%. And that's really significant because it's an easy win. One-stop border posts, paperless trade, harmonizing standards, really you know, easy in that regard. Um, finally, in this regard, it's also just a, an opportunity to connect the formal and the informal sectors, uh, and particularly bringing in women, youth, entrepreneurs uh, within the Commonwealth. You know, we have the Commonwealth Business Women's Network, which has an Africa chapter. You know, we have the uh, Alliance of Young Entrepreneurs. Uh, we have the intra-Commonwealth SME network. So there's various ways of linking up buyers and sellers to really take advantage of these opportunities. And overall, I say we need to link this to a number of other existing initiatives like the Commonwealth Connectivity Agenda, which is focused on uh, overcoming some of the digital divides, connecting up through infrastructure, uh, but also broader in terms of the sustainability work, our Commonwealth Blue Charter, and also our Office on Civil and Criminal Justice Reform, which develops a number of model toolkits and laws uh, which can be applied across the Commonwealth. So this is a start of the journey in Africa, as Wamkeli said. Wamkeli is my former colleague uh, at the South African Ministry of Trade, so it's fantastic to see him at the helm of this process. It's a start of a process. Um, not, you know, We shouldn't expect too much overnight, but I think the journey has now started and we've seen implementation and starting to trade by a number of countries under the tariff preferences. Uh, and I think this is really a historical moment that uh, you know, we and our Secretary General really share. So thank you, Arif. I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Brendan. And that's been a really, very, you know, comprehensive, but actually a very useful um, context in terms of looking at um, why, you know, this is so important, but why it's so important to all of us as well, who are outside of Africa, um, elsewhere in the Commonwealth, and also looking at some of the significant impacts. Um, I mean, you talked about um, paperless trade. I mean, you talked about um, um, inclusive um, growth or inclusive trade with women and younger people and entrepreneurs. Um, and clearly, this is um, these are all this is all part of the mix and and of the opportunity. Um, it just one thing, just maybe just to leave you to think about, Brendan. Something that and I, this was referenced actually in the notice. Um, Brendan um, was. I mean, we both, in fact, end up giving our all evidence to the House of Commons Select Committee on International Trade, you'll recall, some two and a half years ago. And it was very interesting. This was a report on trade with developing Commonwealth countries. And that report came out with a very strong message around some of the things you were talking about, Brendan, you know, the importance of making sure that when trade agreements are, are signed and they're implemented, that they include um, people from, um, you know, women and, um, and younger people and from people from diverse backgrounds. I think so that's an interesting thing to, to, to be aware of and also maybe to look at the 
you know, British government responds to that most recently, especially given the fact they're a chair in office. Um, I think your points on the circular economy, I think, were very well taken. I was just um, looking at Lucy while you were saying that, remembering the Commonwealth Local Government Forum that held an event only last year with the Commonwealth Businessmen's Network. And one of the key parts of that discussion was about an Africa network on the circular economy that I think brings together some 14 countries across Africa that's already doing things on the ground, working um, with governments and, and also working with enterprises as well. So you're absolutely right to signpost some of those areas that are clearly emerging. Um, and thank you very much for that context. So let me turn. Now, the sun is shining here in London right now. And I don't know, Frank, what it's like in Nairobi. I know you're a few hours ahead. I assume you're in Nairobi. Um, very good to um, to have you with us again. Um, let me just uh, introduce um, um, Frank. In fact, we were last together, I think, at the all-party parliamentary group on trade out of poverty just before the, the lead up to what we thought was going to be the Rwanda Chogham last year. Um, but Frank, um, Frank uh, Mitzert is the Chief Executive Officer of Trademark East Africa, which is a not-for-profit organization funded by a range of development agencies to promote regional trade and economic integration within East Africa. Um, he's an experienced senior economic development and private sector specialist. Um, and prior to his role at Trademark East Africa, he was a senior growth trade investment advisor for East Africa at DFID. You remember the acronym DFID, of course, now it's part of FCDO, um, based in Nairobi, um, where he was responsible for establishing and managing DFID's regional approach and programs. Uh, Frank, we're delighted to have you with us today. And, um, and uh, over to you to give a, a sort of a, a view from the ground, so to speak, and also draw, if I may say, on some of the, the great work that Trademark East Africa does, both in terms of research, but also engagement. And I know that the Commonwealth Businesswomen's Network has had a very good working relationship with you as well on some of the work of the Women's Affairs Ministers meeting that took place about 18 months ago. But Frank, a very warm welcome to you. Well, uh, probably warmer in, in Nairobi, but a war warmish welcome to you from London. <laughs> Okay, well, well, thanks, Arif, and, and lovely to see you. And uh, yeah, you know, uh, thanks so much for inviting me um, this evening. Yep, it's 7.30 at night here. So uh, yeah, we're a bit ahead of you in terms of the time. Um, yeah, you know what, I, I, I think um, Brendan's really set the scene well, and he, he actually said a lot of the stuff that, um, that I was thinking of saying, but maybe um, I was also asked to talk a bit about sustainability and climate change. So I thought, you know, maybe if I can just talk about, you know, the impact and, and the meaning of this, uh, you know, really important trade agreement. And then, you know, as you said, Arif, maybe to draw on some of the experience we've had here on, in East Africa. And yes, I, I, I should have said I'm in Nairobi. So, um, I mean, I think, uh, you know, I, I think one of the, you know, Brendan, you said, said it well, the, the issue in Africa is not so much tariffs. It, it's actually the other things that stop trade happening. And you you mentioned the very high trade costs. I mean, the trade costs, um, you know, can be two or three times that of the developed world. And that's a big problem. And in many parts of Africa, just to do simple things like trade across a border can be very difficult. And, you know, I don't have to remind the audience how difficult trade be, can be to sustain during a COVID environment where truck drivers are being stopped and they can't move across the border because of the medical issues and the tests. And uh, <laughs> I think, Brendan, that's where a lot of the borders are with South Africa at the moment. You know, there's, there's, there are major issues. So I, I think really, you know, what, what I wanted to say is, you know, to avoid the, um, this, you know, great potential trade agreement um, remaining largely on paper and unused is the importance of actually the trade facilitation side. And Brendan, you touched on a lot of this, um, big infrastructure gaps um, across a lot of the continent, particularly along some of the key transport corridors. And the borders are what we call in the game, in, 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 in the trade, sticky. They're very thick borders. They're hard to get through. The cost of doing business um, in Africa, with Africa, is very high, and it shouldn't be. So the kind of things that are needed are some of the things you touched on is really I think uh, upgrading of the infrastructure backbone, um, you know, um, looking at the introduction of one-stop border posts, but to do that requires a lot of policy harmonization. On average, um, the, the work that we've done on borders here, we worked on 15, we actually managed to reduce the time through the borders by 70% prior to the COVID uh, pandemic, which is a good result. And that was partially through 
infrastructure upgrading, but also through digitization. All right. And I think the, the second thing I really wanted to say is we need quite a step forward on digitization to remove corruption, uh, remove paper processes and and help trade move easier. And again, I mean, I'd, I'll just, you know, you were talking Arif, about our new chair of the Commonwealth, Rhonda. Um, you know, the Rhonda electronic single window, 70 percent of the trade process is brought into the digital realm now, I think. Reduce the time from 11 days now to, I think, 10 hours uh, to clear goods. So this digitization has a big impact. And Brendan, you were talking about trade governance. Trade governance has um, improved a lot here in East. In other parts of the continent, has actually got worse. Um, and, you know, digitization has a big role to play in trying to make, you know, the trade environment a lot more predictable and a lot more transparent. So, you know, at a macro level, Arif, you know, I'd say the kind of being in the field here in Nairobi, working on this stuff now for 10 years, and I think I've got a couple of colleagues, and uh, I know Andrew Mould um, from UNECA is on, on the line today as well. You know, a lot of the research points to just the massive impact of trade facilitation. And to me, you know, tariffs are important, but really these things are the things that can stop the trade agreement um, being, being used fully. And, and, you know, I mean, I could go on a bit, but issues like standards are also very important. And there, I think the Commonwealth advantage is important, actually, in terms of, you know, um, thinking about how uh, standards can, you know, be harmonized and mutually recognized. And standards are going to be, you know, a major stumbling block. Um, the rules of origin and the negotiations are, I think, you know, actually moving forward better than everyone thought. Um, but, you know, I, I think still there's a big issue with thinking about local content um, requirements for the rules of origin for the CFTA. And don't forget that the CFTA will be applied um, basically in regard to other existing trade agreements. So here where I sit in Nairobi, we're part of the East African community. We have a customs union, a common market, and, you know, the trade regime um, for Kenya, where I'm sitting with the partners, would be under EAC terms. Mm -hmm. However, if if um, Kenya wanted to trade, say, for example, with Mozambique, it could choose tripartite terms that have been agreed between SADC, EAC and COMESA, or indeed CFTA terms. Mm -hmm. So, And then if Kenya wants to trade with Ghana right across the continent, Actually, that would be on CFTA terms because there's no trade agreement in place. So the thing I'm trying to bring across in saying all that is actually, um, you know, it's quite a challenge for a lot of the customs administrations to actually think about how they're going to implement this. Mm -hmm. Because there are a number of, of customs jurisdictions that could be applied. And I think that's important. So maybe to turn to the issue then of sustainability um, and particularly the climate change aspects. Um, I mean, one of the things we've been doing here, and, and it's, I'm, I'm glad you asked me this question because it's quite an interesting one. Um, morally, we are increasing more trade, but we're therefore increasing carbon footprint, you know, the, the, the pollution and all the emissions that come with trade. And all of us want to see trade happen. It's, it's great for jobs. It's great for well-being. But the carbon footprint needs to be something that we think through. And I think the CFTA can provide us with an opportunity to start thinking about that across Africa. And we've been doing some thinking about this and, and, and actually planning some new programming, which will be looking at the key transport corridors, Ari, and thinking, how can we reduce the carbon footprint? So here we're talking about modal ships, um, shifts from road to rail, which has a lower carbon footprint. Thinking also, oddly enough, about lake transport, which is far less polluting, you know, here in East Africa, we've been thinking a lot about Lake Victoria, Lake Tanganyika, Lake Kivu. Um, but lake transport is important. And equally, so is marine transport. Marine uh, transport uh, can have a very heavy emission uh, carbon footprint. And it's something that we need to think hard about reducing. Um, so in terms of transport and logistics, there's quite a lot we can do to think about greening the transport corridors to reduce the carbon footprint. And we reckon... It's actually interesting that um, could go with with probably about a target in East Africa, reducing the carbon footprint by 10 or 15 percent through those kind of modal shifts. All right. The other thing 
But I think it's interesting to think about when it comes to, <coughs> excuse me, um, climate change and reducing emissions is, is actually vehicle technology. And it's, you know, I think the shift from, um, you know, basically car, the, 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 the normal petrol diesel engines to electric and battery technology actually, interestingly enough, could be cheaper in many parts of Africa because transport is very focused on very few transport linkages, you know? So in other words, if you tackle traffic along the key um, trunk roads, you're going to actually catch most traffic. That's not necessarily the case in Europe and, and the US, for example. So it could be cheaper to actually think about doing that and leveraging a lot more private sector investment. Even now, in the trucking industry, uh, there, there's looks at the next. There, there, there's this work being handled on the next generation of of trucks that could actually be, for example, hydrogen or electric powered. So you know, those are some of the ways. I think the other thing, obviously, one big aspect of the CFTA is, is um, industrialization, and I mean, COVID. You know, the COVID problem has presented a shortening of supply chains. I think you talked about Arif and their pr potential for more production in Africa is good. The rules of origin aside um, and the local content requirements, you know, there could be a lot to think about circular um, and green production. All right. And, uh, you know, this is one of the things, again, we've been looking at with a couple of pilot projects we've been thinking and working with the private sector on, which is a circular economy um, approach to powering industrial zones. And here, the carbon footprint of production would fall. And theoretically, um, you could easily get pre premium prices for exports coming out of those industrial zones that are you know, renewably powered. And finally, I'd say e-commerce has a big role to play. I mean, e-commerce across the continent is um, something we really need to think hard about. I think, Brendan, again, you mentioned that. Um, it's something where there's still more negotiation, I think, to be undertaken for the CFTA. But here, um, policy frameworks are required to help e-commerce fully develop. I mean, here in Kenya, we've got quite a good framework in Rwanda. Um, in other parts of East Africa, for example, in Tanzania, far less developed. So it's something that that is worth thinking about regionally and continentally and you know, offers a lot of potential also for smaller businesses to engage much more across the continent. So those are some of the, the thoughts on how we could uh, improve the carbon footprint and sustainability of trade, and also um, try to think about how we can really use uh, and, and catalyze the potential of this trade agreement. Because the potential is high. Um, I think you, you and others have said that already, but unless the actual um, practical and physical aspects of trade, um, some of these trade facilitation issues are, are addressed, we're not likely to see the potential being realized for a while to come. So I think it's really important that we invest in the kind of trade facilitation reforms to unleash the potential of this for the Commonwealth members in Africa, but also um, for all of Africa and uh, the rest of the Commonwealth to trade with Africa. So Arif, I hope that's, that's given you what you wanted from me. Um, let me stop there. Frank, thank you very much indeed. And that's been a really helpful um, contribution, and I think also very much from the ground. And I, I look forward, Frank, to, to, um, to, my, to my journey on the Mombasa Nairobi Railway, which I missed out on because it was still being constructed when I was last in Mombasa. But those, um, those links between um, you know, um, economic hubs are so crucial, aren't they? And you talked about that, um, obviously, in, in Kenya, but also the importance and the impact of digital trade. I think Rwanda, very interesting um, example that you've highlighted about how they're digitizing. But also, um, you know, when we think about these industries, and you and Brendan have talked about you know the growth in economic potential but services i think is of particular interest you know and how does the service you know if you think about the services industries yes it's tourism but it's also so much more as well you know and i would also just throw into the mix the creative industries and i know that yeah. later we'll be i'm um, hearing a bit more about that um but i think that's interesting also because perhaps that also opens up more opportunities for women as well you know women are uh, very um, you know, concentrated perhaps um, in the in that area in some areas in some respects. So that's something which we'll pick up on. But also, you know, very important points you were making about 
sustainability and the carbon footprint. Um, this is, of course, happening in a year, although we haven't directly referenced it, but we should do so now. Um, COP26 is a few months away. In fact, the Commonwealth meeting, Brendan, will be, you know, as it was before, perhaps one of the most crucial staging points. In fact, perhaps the most crucial, because by the time we get to the UN General Assembly in September, you know, it'll be far too close to COP26 to have real progress. If we haven't got real progress by then, we're in deep trouble. So I think the um, importance of the Commonwealth in June, Frank, and also acting as a bridge towards COP26 is perhaps another reason why connecting the dots between trade and climate change will become even more important. Um, and I think that's that's clearly um, going to happen. And, um, you know, the, 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 the music is mood music is, is, is already building and happening that way. But thank you very much for, for laying that out, Frank. Um, so, so clearly for us, and also giving up us a perspective from from Nairobi. So we're, this is one of the benefits, Philip and I were saying, of having these things now under COVID-19 in London. You have to do it all virtually, but we can bring you in, Frank, by the click <laughs> of a button, um, although hopefully the technology won't fall apart. Um, so I'm going to turn, I mean, pick up really, really what you were saying, what you and Brendan were both talking about in terms of um, e-commerce. And clearly at the continental level, um, the African um, continental free trade area negotiations are um, you know, still um, working on this area of including a protocol on e-commerce under phase three, which presents a unique opportunity for African countries to collectively establish common positions on e-commerce, harmonize digital economy regulations and leverage the benefits of e-commerce. And I'm delighted that um, this meeting is happening um, just a few days. So it's perhaps one of the first, if not the first, um, from the public events at which this report, a major report on this, um, has just um, recently been um, um, published by the um, Overseas Development Institute in London, which is specifically um, on this whole area of e-commerce and preferential trade agreements, implications for African firms and the African free trade area. And this report, which um, um, Karishma will be talking about in a moment, um, um, which was supported in part by um, um, UK government and others, um, I think is going to be very helpful in that regard. So just before um, I invite Karishma to, um, to, to speak, um, just to um, uh, introduce her. She's a research fellow at the Overseas Development Institute in London. I think, the, I think Karishma, I think for many years now, the ODI has kind of led in terms of um, electronic engagement on um, its think tanks, you know, sort of sort of drawing in even 10 years ago, you were webcasting um, your events. Um, and so you've been always very strong in that area. You're a visiting research fellow at the Center for Trade and Economic Integration um, in Geneva as well. And uh, and um, and you've also, I know, um, you, you have a PhD from the University of Manchester. Um, your work focuses on the digital economy at ODI in the future of manufacturing the development model and um and i know that you're shortly taking up a position position at um the um institute of development studies at the university of sussex so delighted to have you with us i should also mention um in the interest of full not so much full just transparency but or full disclosure but full recognition that you were one of the lead authors for the landmark report that came out last year on commonwealth digital connectivity and i do encourage people to look at that report um provide the first real landscape view of the Commonwealth. Um, Brenton and his team were very much, um, you know, it came out as Commonwealth Secretary report. Um, in fact, it came out during the last face-to-face -face meeting that Commonwealth officials participated in, in London, the Commonwealth Connectivity Cluster Week back in February last year. Karishma, delighted to have you with us and a warm welcome. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Arif, and thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, I hope I'm audible properly. Great. So um, I have a few slides. So let me just share my screen quickly. Um, there you go. Uh, so if there's any problem in uh, the slides moving, RF, just let me know. I think sometimes uh, Zoom tends to get a little stuck. Uh, so uh, yes, um, as RF mentioned, um, I've been working on um, e-commerce and more broadly digital economy issues within Africa uh, for, uh, for a couple of years now. And we've recently launched this report with the African Trade Policy Center um, at UNECA on uh, e-commerce and preferential trade agreements and what that means for uh, for African firms and the AFCFTA. So just to give you a bit of the context, um, e-commerce was first included as a topic uh, in a trade agreement back in 2001 but it now represents 30% of the notified trade agreements within the WTO. 
And outside the WTO currently, there are 86 countries that have signed a joint statement initiative to commence negotiations um, on trade related aspects of e-commerce. But within this JSI, there are only five African countries which are involved or signatories to it. And um, we also have uh, a protocol on e-commerce being launched under phase three negotiations of the AFCFTA. And that's likely to be fast tracked now, given that um, you know, the increasing importance um, of e-commerce during, uh, during the pandemic um, and in post-crisis recovery. And there have been some studies looking at implications of e-commerce for developing countries and LDCs. But the main research gap in our opinion is that there is a, there's a gap between what uh, e-commerce proposals um, at the global level actually mean for African private sector and do they actually reflect the priorities for African uh, businesses. And that is the main gap that this report um, addresses. So just very quickly, um, and I think it's a useful starting point is to acknowledge that there is a lot of um, contention around how these e-commerce products should be classified. So whether they should be treated as electronically transmitted goods um, and therefore subject to the GATT agreement, or whether they should be classified as electronically traded services, uh, in which case they will be under uh, the GATT agreements and the commitments made by countries um, under that. And then which, if they're treated as services, which mode of uh, you know, services supply actually applies to these uh, traded services and with sectoral commitments are more appropriate because countries have different commitments under audiovisual sector, value addition, basic telecommunication um, within the GATS itself. And now with the rise of mode five services, things have become even more complicated. So these mode five services are um, services which are embedded within products. So you have um, you know, increasingly pacemakers, for instance, right, which have uh, digital services embedded within these products. So um, the rise of such uh, products uh, is also making it uh, very difficult now for uh, to reach a consensus on how e-commerce products should be classified. So um, having said that, just to give you a brief outline on uh, the scope and methodology of the study. So uh, by no means are we claiming that this is a representative study in terms of the country coverage um, or, um, or the business representation, but it is more of a first step towards going beyond uh, what is the secondary data, which is actually available and collecting primary data on analyzing what uh, African businesses really want and how that is being reflected in negotiations. So we have broadly classified the research under three areas. Uh, the first is data governance. So this looks at privacy, security, data localization, um, and so on. Uh, the second one is uh, cross-border e-commerce trade facilitation. So here we look at paperless trade, parcel delivery, postal competence, and more aspects of trade facilitation. And the third is digital business taxation. So for the purpose of this presentation, I'm going to just stick with the first two, which is data governance and trade facilitation. And uh, primary data in the study is collected uh, mainly through an online survey uh, from firms in Kenya, Rwanda, and Nigeria. And um, we had around 31 businesses responding during this COVID pandemic. And uh, we also did uh, in-depth telephonic interviews uh, with 15 um, of these companies. So uh, this is just a distribution of uh, the respondents within the survey. So we have 20 of these companies from Kenya, uh, six from Rwanda and three from Nigeria. And there's good representation across sectors. So we have 11 from manufacturing, 10 from uh, wholesale and retail services sectors, five from agro-processing um, and others in the financial services sector, technical services uh, industries. Um, interestingly, majority of the firms in our sample are actually small and medium enterprises. So these are ones which are built less than 100 employees. And um, around 67% of the sample is owned by uh, is male business owners and 33% is female uh, business owners in the sample. So um, the one thing that clearly jumped out from the survey is uh, that e-commerce is more important now than ever. So we had around 60% of the firms in our sample uh, reporting an increase in e-commerce during the COVID uh, pandemic. And some of them have even diversified into new markets as a result of um, e-commerce platforms. And this uh, jump is actually even more so in smaller e-commerce companies than the larger ones. Uh, but there are definitely lots of supply side disruptions during uh, the pandemic. For instance, there are administrative and regulatory bottlenecks, uh, border delays, quarantine conditions, um, as well as suspension of manufacturing activities, um, which was leading to supply side and supply chain problems for e-commerce. 
So when we look at uh, the first set of questions in the survey, which is around uh, data governance, uh, so here to just give you a little bit of background at what is happening in, in the negotiations in general. Um, there are three, four, you know, approaches which come up. Uh, so the first one is the US approach, which advocates for free cross-border data flows and proposes a ban on data localization and source code sharing requirements. And this is more driven by sort of the interest of digital giants. Uh, the second approach is the EU approach, which is also advocating for a free cross-border flow of data, uh, but allows member states to design their own rules. And this is primarily driven by uh, privacy issues. Um, then you have the Chinese approach, which is more skeptical on free cross-border data flows, bans on data localization and source code sharing. And then you have a group of countries, which is mainly the Africa group, India and South Africa, which are resisting cross-border free flow of data um, and resisting bans on data localization and source code sharing, given the argument that um, these countries are still in the development stages of e-commerce and digital trade and need to focus on building their domestic industry without perhaps engaging in premature uh, negotiations. So those are the different approaches uh, taken by groups at um, the global level. So um, when we look at what this really means for, uh, for African firms, so um, on the one hand, data localization requirements um, can um, increase additional economic costs for these firms, for African firms, um, for foreign firms investing in Africa, and as a result, might discourage uh, firms from in investing. But on the other hand, it can also encourage developed country firms to set up local uh, data centers uh, you know, within the African continent if a continental approach is uh, taken, which can actually result in the flow of um, FDI as well as skills development within the continent. So there are definitely pros and cons um, of data localization. Um, within the sample, we find that 60% of the firms are actually storing the data in the cloud and around 30% are storing the data locally. So what this means is that any sort of um, data localization requirements that are put in place uh, will um, ultimately result in these firms having to adjust their uh, you know, current business pra practices around data localization. And uh, what, is, what is clearly emerged from the interviews with these firms is that there is a need for uh, building internal capacity for data. So even if some of these countries you know, put in place data localization policies to meet specific development objectives, there's a need for complementary policies around data processing, analyzing, um, and sharing. Uh, so the firms advocate a strong need for building internal capacity for data sorting, analysis, and awareness on terms and conditions um, of data sharing. Regionally, however, there is a different uh, story. So 100% of the firms, all 31 of them, um, express interest in selling on a regional platform, and 19 of them express the need for regional data sharing for boosting e-commerce. So, um, you know, there clearly appears to be um, a strong interest in taking a regional approach for development of these um, e-commerce platforms. But again, the interviews here uh, clearly confirm that there are concerns regarding data privacy and accuracy, particularly in the case of any regional data sharing platforms, which is assumed to be run by governments by these firms. So they advocate that um, the, the data which the governments have on businesses are outdated um, and inaccurate and as, a result, and as a result might not really uh, be beneficial. So there are concerns regarding that. And interestingly, we find that 50% um, of the female owned enterprises do not want intra-regional data sharing or are not sure about this. But 70% of male owned enterprises um, you know, are happy and advocate the need for um, intra-regional data sharing. Um, on source code sharing and technical transfer, there is a clear need highlighted by respondents for the need of uh, technology transfer from developed country firms to African firms. So 28 businesses express the desire to gain access to digital intelligence generated by uh, foreign firms. And this is also communicated in the Africa Trade Report in 2019 by the African Exim Bank that um, a ban, an outright ban on requiring any sort of transfer of source code can prevent technology transfer requirements uh, uh, from um, developed countries to um, African firms. Now, interestingly, the challenges to e-commerce are no longer uh, more around high internet costs or internet reliability or digital penetration, which has been the case for many years. But a large number of firms actually rank load online trust as the key obstacle um, in constraining e-commerce in Africa. So this results as a lack of uh, consumer protection, lack of dispute resolution mechanisms, particularly for online trade, um, as well as uh, you know, concerns around data privacy, um, you know, and what happens, what kind of products are actually being delivered and 
and what happens if there's a um, there's a problem. So I think this is a key challenge that is constraining um, e-commerce in Africa at the moment. And when we look at um, the sort of different types of e-commerce model, what is really interesting is that a large number of initiatives and policy programs um, on e-commerce in Africa focus um, largely on third-party platforms and access to third-party platforms. Um, currently, we find that actually 64% of the firms in the sample are predominantly selling through their own e-commerce website. So whether this is directly through their website or through online uh, contact forms. Uh, these firms find third-party e-commerce platforms um, quite expensive because they charge a high commission fees, uh, which is usually around 10 to 15%, but can actually go as high as 30 to 40% for certain uh, product commodities. And interestingly, all the four uh, the firms in our sample, which are selling through third party platforms are all male owned um, enterprises. So um, just when we look at, um, when we ask the firms to rank, which are the top five obstacles for the AFCFTA to address in order to boost cross-border e-commerce, um, you know, it, it clearly emerges that the traditional challenge you know, still persists. So there is challenges around logistics, postal competence and delivery, which is still a primary challenge. So you have a large number of firms actually uh, trading through non-formal channels, which is using a network of buses. And what that means is that all the goods are being delivered uh, at a faster rate and at a cheaper rate than let's say using courier companies. Uh, this is coming at the cost of disjointed logistics because then the firms are only able to sell online to those country uh, cities where there's actually a head office of the, the bus company. Uh, secondly, there are also issues around foreign taxation, double taxation, um, unawareness of national and regional rules. So firms are not really clear on which products are banned in which countries, what are the customs uh, procedures and what rates are going to be charged uh, to them. Um, there's also a lack of online payment solutions and insecure, um, unreliable payment systems, which has come up. And the problem necessarily here is not that, uh, you know, there is a lack of um, local providers, but more so that most of these firms are actually using, they're actually hosting their websites on international, um, internationally hosted platforms, which are not, um, uh, which, which are not uh, integrated with local payment uh, providers like Equitel or Pespal. And as a result, these firms then have to gain access to um, uh, foreign providers such as PayPal, but then again, they charge very high uh, commission fees. So I think these sort of issues have you know, definitely come up. Um, and then we, when we ask like, which regulations are critical for boosting intra-regional e-commerce, um, so in line with what we just saw, uh, firms rank harmonized laws for taxation as one of the important challenges uh, uh, regulations for boosting e-commerce, uh, consumer protection regulations for building digital trust, as well as harmonized laws on electronic trade, digital signatures, and e-transactions. And interestingly, it is the smaller firms which are really focusing on this e-trade transactions and, and, you know, and express interest in harmonization to, to boost trade uh, within um, the EAC region. So just uh, in conclusion, you know, a number of issues have come up in the study. Uh, so the first is that there is low participation of African firms on third party platforms as a result of the business models of these uh, platforms. Uh, the cost of logistics is making it very difficult to ship goods across borders. Um, as a result, and as a result, most of these firms are um, accessing, you know, trade through informal channels. Uh, there is low awareness regarding national and regional rules on taxation, custom procedures, and duties. Um, there is a strong need for development of regional data sharing platforms, which have up-to-date and accurate information on businesses, um, as well as supporting capacity building um, on data processing and analysis. And lastly, there is a, you know, urgent need to increase online trust for consumers. Uh, so this can be done through providing online data on authentic sellers um, using e-commerce trust marks, as well as providing more clarity um, on the rules of origin. And uh, here, I think the AFC FTA obviously has an important and a crucial role to play. Uh, but what African negoci negotiators may need to uh, think about is what parts of e-commerce are most relevant to them. So e-commerce, as we've seen, you know, deals with a range of issues around competition, around um, consumer protection, IP, um, taxation. So it's, it's interrelated to many of these um, issues. So which parts do they want to really address in the e-commerce protocol and, and what should be the depth of these commitments, whether they're hard commitments or, or soft commitments providing a more sort of a guiding framework. Then there's a need to 
um, decide on, you know, and come to a consensus on the classification of e-commerce products, as I mentioned, whether it should be treated as goods, uh, services, or maybe included as a separate, uh, you know, separate chapter in itself. And thirdly, there's a strong need for harmonizing and providing a common framework for strengthening consumer protection and, and data governance with sector specific policies uh, for critical sectors within the AFCFTA. And as uh, Frank mentioned here, I think um, regional dialogue is also very key uh, for implementation as well as for coherency uh, so that countries are not you know, unnecessarily charged with more uh, sort of procedures. Um, and lastly, the aim of the e-commerce protocol should be to identify, coordinate, and boost initiatives uh, which can reduce obstacles faced by MSMEs um, in Africa and facilitate uh, cross-border e-commerce. And this is what we're working on currently as a follow-up paper with ATPC, really looking at what are the priorities for the e-commerce protocol. And I'm happy to um, you know, share this with um, all of you in due course. Um, but as of now, the full report is available at the ODI website. And um, you know, I encourage you to take a look and I'm happy to engage um, in any further discussions and uh, queries on this. Uh, so thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for that, uh, Karishma. And uh, I mean, you've get, again, you know, you've given a very, um, you know, very useful analysis there of some of the opportunities but challenges in terms of e-commerce. I thought that the gender um, um, uh, analysis there was very interesting. That you we saw more reticence from um, from from um, from women than men in terms of some of those regional um, uh, linkages that you were talking about, but also some of the other challenges in terms of capacity that you were highlighting, some of the sectoral variation um, as well. And I think this this the the point that uh, you know. It, about capacity, I think is clearly one that was. I remember it was being certainly highlighted in the in the Commonwealth Digital Connectivity Report that you worked on last year. But clearly, you can see that also coming up in the survey data that you were highlighting here, which um, you know I, I think is happening at a very uh, is a very crucial moment when you know we're seeing demographic change, perhaps also um, not just in the region but more broadly, providing perhaps more opportunities for people to connect. Um, it's interesting this point that you raised about marketplaces. Um, and while you've been chatting, and I was listening, Karishma, while you were speaking, but um, there are a number of reports that I posted links to. So. Um, um, there you are, Philip. There's a PhD student. Clearly, had been at work here. All the links, but there are a number of recent reports that have come out. And I think what's quite striking is how much work there has been in recent months. You know, from the Google report end of last year to um, to um, um, the World Trade Organization just brought out a, a, a major report and other work as well. So this is clearly an area people don't have the answers. They're looking for clarity. Policymakers are open to suggestions. I think it was also very striking. Maybe this is something just to think on also, Karishma. Um, we haven't really perhaps addressed enough, although it's there perhaps to some extent, the elephant in the room, or perhaps, Philip, I should say, the African elephant in the room, which is the, um, the, the World Trade Organization and, the, and the, the lack of progress in terms of some of these areas. You talked about, um, you know, some of the areas within you know, Africa, but of course, these are partly informed by what's happening beyond, um, you know, whether issues around dispute resolution or else. And, uh, you know, it was interesting that the new Deputy General, not sure she hasn't started yet, but the Deputy, Deputy General designate from the World Trade Organization. Um, we can say she was the Commonwealth candidate because she was down to the last two and the other was a Korean. So um, was um, was talking about the importance of uh, of um, sustainability and growth and um, and some of the issues that you were highlighting. So it'll be interesting to see whether there's more scope, especially given the fact I think it's um, later this year i think they're planning to have the first um or the you know for some time now the wto ministerial meeting which will be you know hopefully give some impetus to some of these things as well but all of this will need a kind of evidence base from which to draw policy and that's why i think Karishma, your remarks are really and frank and brendan so to the message because you know evidence will emerge from africa from how this trade agreement is beginning to unfold now that it's being operationalized so thank you very much for that and also sharing that report so a link to that report is on chat now as well as um, various other reports feel free to access them um, later and um, and look at them um, and share them and talk about them um, so i'm going to turn next to um, dr namdi medici so Dr. Medici is a, a colleague of mine for um, my uh, day job. I'm at the uh, Bloomsbury Institute just next door to Senate House. Um, we're also in Bedford Square. Um, uh, and um, 
Dr. Medici um, for a number of years headed up our Center for Research and Enterprise there and has been very active um, in publishing and writing in a number of areas, but particularly in the creative industries and was the editor of a, of a major report, a working paper um, that came out from Bloomsbury Institute a few months ago, looking at creative industries in the Commonwealth. Um, and I'd like uh, Dr. Medici um, to invite you to uh, make a few brief remarks to us now. And after Dr. Medici's remarks, I think it's just Dr. Medici speaking, um, we'll then open the floor up for discussion. So we've got, we'll have plenty of time for that. Uh, we won't be going beyond six. I know six, Frank, is your 9 p.m. So thank you very much. I hope we've not disrupted your dinner too much. But um, Namdi, over to you. All right, Dr. Medici was here. I saw him earlier. I'm not sure whether there's a problem. I, I saw him on the list. Let me just double check that he's still with us. Um, he is here. Right. Hello, Professor Medici. Good, good, good to have you with us. You're not in Lagos, you're only in the UK, so you yeah, no excuse for connectivity issues, although I know in the UK we have our own connectivity issues at times. Uh, Dr. Medici, great to have you with us. Professors in the house, over to you, Dr. Medici. Thank you, can you hear me? Yes, just turn up the volume a bit, or we'll do it ourselves if we can at our end, but... Uh, please, please do. Okay, over to you. Right, okay. Um, I've been having some challenges, actually. I, I swapped from my uh, smartphone to the laptop and uh, back to... Uh, smartphone and now I'm back to the laptop because I just wanted to share some slides. Um, thanks, Ari, for that introduction. Um, I'm, it's a very interesting um, session. Uh, first, of, first and foremost, I'd like to apologize on behalf of my colleague, uh, Professor Ebo Hinson at the University of Ghana Business School. Uh, we're working together on a book project on creative industries in Africa, and uh, we're looking at it from the context of the um, after. Uh, one of the key things I just thought I should highlight and something that's actually propelled or given us uh, the reason the tray to want to engage with the creative industries is the fact that every time you hear about uh, international agreements, um, uh, partnerships, developments, everything revolves or kind of centers around trade. And um, by trade, I'm um, talking in terms of physical goods. You're talking about transportation, cost of moving. Yes, if you're moving, moving products like guitars, pianos, and artworks, then you're welcome to have a conversation with us. Now, with no further ado, let me see if I can share my uh, screen. I just wanted to um, highlight part of um, what we're doing at the moment in terms of the creative industries. Um, let's have a look. If it will work, where are we? Can you see my screen? Yeah, all, all, yeah. all clear. Yeah. Right, this is not really the first slide, but that would do. It says the context. Um, thanks, Ari, for sharing this because it came from the ITC, uh, one of those reports, uh, the ITC um, trade. Um, uh, lecture, so to speak. And it kind of puts things in context because we're looking at creative industries where we, we know there are various definitions, but I love this image because what it does is compartmentalize the creative industries into four key categories. If you look at the left-hand column, it tells you that the first category is heritage. The second arts, then you got media. And of course, under the functional creations, you also find new media. So this is one of the key drivers of the creative industries and some of the key dynamics in that particular sector on the African continent. As that continent begins to diversify its economy and begin to realize that there is actually so much that the sector can do for enhancing and growing the GDP. And besides that, it also impacts upon meeting the sustainable development goals, ranging from the SDG one, two, three, all the way through to the partnerships. Um, if you talk about quality education, you begin to talk about uh, engaging the youth and of course, uh, uh, gender balance and you name it. Um, I'll just share some insights or some of the 
news items. Um, it's hard work trying to summarize something that might come up in from about 600 page document into say a one page and talk for about 10, 15 minutes. But I'll try as much as possible to capture some of these key themes by highlighting some of the recent trends in that particular sector on that particular continent. And of course, I'll throw the question on to after in terms of what are you doing about this? Right, this slide seems frozen. I can't seem to go, All right, okay, let's have a look. Right, so uh, just before the lockdown, I, I was in, I was in this place because I'm trying to ask people what they think about this. If you remember from the previous slide, we talked about heritage. So I'm, I wanna start with heritage. So in um, January, 2020, uh, over a year ago, just over a year ago, how time flies. I was in this particular country and there was something, there was an aftermath of what you call the year of return. So this is actually what the, uh, the Minister for Tourism, Ghana Tourism Authority said in terms of building on the year of return. 2019 was a year of return where the diaspora returned to uh, the homeland. And Ghana is at the heart of it when you talk about heritage. And that is very interesting and instructive um, sort of dynamic. So while I was there trying to take in on, on having missed the, the celebrations that happened in 2019, I did a presentation at Creative Industries. And that's where I began to appreciate some of the key dynamics in that particular sector and, and how heritage can be honed through tourism. And of course, what are the key components or the ecosystem of that particular tourism? Um, Ghana is very rich in that particular sector. And these were the seven key points on the agenda as stipulated by the Minister for, uh, for the, uh, the Director General of the Ghana Tourism Authority. Bed rights and return journey, branding, marketing, advertising. These are clearly creative industry sector um, um, elements. Citizenship drive, diaspora investments. That's the D word, the dreaded D word coming up twice. Diaspora, diaspora. And Arif, you're, you're, you're familiar with um, the, the, the role of diaspora and, and what we, we need to uh, make sure that it, it, it's bring, uh, brought into that conversation. So you can begin to see elements of heritage tourism and of course the Pan-African legacy village. So these are the magnificent seven that were stipulated in that particular country and that context with implications for the broader Africa. So that's part of the heritage. Also on that heritage factor, this lady I just came across um, about two days ago, Kavita Shelaram. Um, you can see it says London, Lagos, Mumbai. She's lived in all those three cities and she loves her art. She used to collect art. If you look at the, um, th that's from the Financial Times, it's a very recent publication. Uh, she talked about how she, dis uh, she well, not, not dispensed of per se, but just shelved her Indian art that she claimed was more popular than anything African art at, at that time. When she moved to Lagos, she started collecting arts, local arts. And of course, she developed her own studio. In, she has a, a Lagos-based studio, and um, so she, she, she I, I think she probably has three different nationalities, British, Nigerian, and, and Indian. So that's something that's quite interesting about Kavita Chelaram. Um, do take time out and read her story because I think it's very moving. Then on the right-hand side of that particular slide, you find um, the Congolese activists who has been going around Europe's museums and, and um, technically speaking, stealing African arts because he's a champion of restitution of, of, of African arts that were supposedly stolen from Africa uh, when, when they, they weren't very much appreciated. Now, the question now is, which way do we go? Is it in, in terms of being that um, activist in, 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 in our approach to, to uh, rediscovery art emerging from that particular continent or to begin to have that conversation and negotiate how we actually borrow, exchange and lend the, 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 the artworks or the create whatever uh, it is that, is that falls under the definition of uh, creative industries from Africa. These things need to be negotiated. And of course, we've, we've seen how, how museums tend to borrow pieces for display um, over a particular period of time and return them and all those uh, particular discussions that revolve around that. So 
Um, and if you remember that slide I, I put forward, I, I said, um, I mentioned heritage, one of those categorizations, which is number one. And of course it does capture museums. Um, talking about museums and, and the independent art galleries. Now, this was um, one of the articles I put in a blog post, um, and it was talking about uh, a Manchester UK based art gallery that collects African arts to showcase. And the, the conversation I'm trying to highlight here is that most of what could be done uh, institutionally and in, more, in a more holistic manner tends to be uh, to take some kind of independent, fragmented sort of approach. And, and that narrative needs to change because uh, the, the whole is not the same as some of its parts. That's something that we probably need to think in terms of. And um, another one that's quite interesting is the what's been happening in the lockdown. Now, this is the sixth episode since lockdown of Fashionomics Africa, celebrating anything fashion and the creativity in fashion on the African continent. And of course, it's backed by the African Development Bank. If you look at the bottom of the screen, bottom right-hand corner, you find out that the, one of the key participants at this sixth event, which is happening in about two days time on, on the 26th, is actually uh, somebody from, from after. So that's something you might want to Google, and, and I'm, I'm sure it's open to all to join that conversation. And he's talking about fashion, celebrating fashion and creativity in Africa under the auspices of AFTA. And he's talking about opportunities for fashion entrepreneurs. Now that is design, is creativity, style. So I'll just move on from that slide and um, go into the visual arts. Now, all I've been doing is attending one webinar to the next. And this was quite interesting because it was celebrating photography and it was organized by University of Lagos in Nigeria, the Alumni Association, uh, Association branch. And from that conversation, you could see that photography was becoming a bit more appreciated. And we're not talking about pinhole photography and, 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 and the dark rooms of photography. It's moving towards the digital photography. And of course, discussions around photojournalism interesting event that I attended it was quite, um, it's in the past now, but it was quite enlightening. And, and, and it gave me that momentum to begin to delve a bit deeper into that sector and what it has to offer. Now, this, uh, I'm, I'm just beginning to highlight some of the cases or case illustrations with a slight bi bias towards Nigeria, and of course, to some extent, Ghana. Now, Terra Culture, the MD and Managing Director was on CNN recently talking about theater, theater in, in Nigeria and across Africa. Now, just look at, quickly look at her profile. This is a lawyer from, from, from a family of lawyers. The, the father was a senior advocate of Nigeria. And she's a lawyer, but has decided to pursue her passion, which is theater. And part of the creative dynamics that come with that. That's what she, she tries in doing. You need to go back and listen to that interview and you begin, you see the passion oozing out. This is somebody that actually believes in, in what she's doing. And she's moved on from there to also start uh, mentoring people by, by, by um, establishing an academy for upcoming, uh, uh, for upcoming creatives. Now, that's one of the key things that tends to be missing in Africa as well. Uh, you're looking for role models to bring up the next generation of creatives moving on. Right. Um, in terms of media, now, that's an interesting um, slide. I can't quite remember where I got this from. I think it was from DCMS, uh, Department of Media uh, uh, and Culture, UK, UK Media and Culture. And it just gives you um, some insights into the music ecosystem. Why I decided to put this slide is because it touches upon very important elements such as broadcasting on the, on, on the bottom right, uh, the pink color coded one. I'll just see if I can get my course on there. And of course it talks about governance. Now these are some of the key important elements, education and governance, and of course, community engagement. Then we begin to appreciate that music, the way we consume and produce music has evolved. And Africa is at the heart of it. Moving on from that particular slide, 
um, I'll just highlight one of the key icons who used to be uh, residents uh, in, in London before he moved back to Nigeria. This is um, some gentleman known as Don Jazzy. Don Jazzy used to be a music producer before, uh, used to be a, a music producer before he, he came up with his own studio. So he mastered the craft in, in London and returned to Nigeria and developed the ensemble that has produced uh, high hitting, high performing artists, the likes of Tiwa Savage, uh, were, were part of the Maven Screw ensemble in Nigeria. And he was talking about how he transitioned and how he began to move towards music production. I'm talking about quality music production, identification and development of talent in that particular sphere. And that is uh, part of that uh, uh, sector uh, subcategory media, but focusing on music. Now, another, another artist from, from Nigeria, Davido, uh, just featured in, for the first time, you have in Time 100 Next 2021 lists. Now, but we're looking at, this is Davido, one of the big names from Nigeria, but there, there, are, there are a couple of others that, that get airplay uh, on, on BBC Radio 1 or Capital One Extra. You've got the likes of Bonaboy and Whiskey. There are so many artists. And, 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 but, but again, again, it's not really an industry per se. You, you, you find talents, you find individual talents, but Nigeria and, and West Africa cannot particularly lay any claims to having a creative industry or a music industry per se. And that's one of the key arguments. And that's one of the key areas that we're interrogating to, to try and understand why this isn't happening, what's holding it back, what could be done about it? And of course, how after, and possibly the Commonwealth could uh, come in and, and partner with these um, developmental trends. Um, streaming, now this is quite interesting. Um, first it was Netflix. Uh, we, we've seen how Canal Plus went in there and uh, uh, bought um, Rock, Rock Studios, uh, Amazon Prime, uh, put, you name it, they're there. Most of these tech giants are there in terms of streaming services. Spotify is the latest. You can see this um, journalist here has been doing great, quite a lot of um, good, good work uh, churning out some of these news items and uh, under the auspice of Tech Point Africa. And you can see this is 15 hours ago. When I say 15 hours ago, I'm not talking about last year, 15 hours ago to the start of this particular workshop. So that is the breaking news um, so, um, sort of thing you begin to think in terms of. And um, talking about those giants, you can begin to see that Africa's animation, you, there, there, there's, a, there's um, on my email signature, it says that um, until, until the lions uh, get their own storytellers, the history of the hunt always glorify the hunter. So that narrative about African stories from those on the ground, African voices uh, telling the African stories is beginning to catch on in terms of animation. You can see Netflix uh, and Triggerfish in South Africa as typical examples. Uh, Nigeria's first animated full-length uh, feature, Little Buckets. And of course, you begin to find um, the likes of Animax, which is based in Ghana, going on Amazon Prime. So Netflix is featuring local contents. So you get, you're having local African content for the global players in these particular um, sectors. So again, it's not what you might call a critical mass, so to speak. But there is an opportunity and the, the, the landscape is changing and we can't just sit back and watch that, that, that change go to north. Um, so African legends, again, this is something that is interesting here uh, from the CEO of Letty Arts. Letty Arts, uh, are the owners of the African uh, legends. And you begin to see that um, one of the key things that gives you an idea of what they have in mind is that the intention here is to bring our rich culture into the 21st century. And that is what uh, it's happening there. And another thing you need to think in terms of is the video game developers. So it's not just animation, but also video games, which are 
some of the key um, areas uh, that, that uh, the youths are getting involved in. And of course, you can begin to see that that element of governance and education kicks in as well. And um, right, so these are, uh, yep, Kola Wale, the lady I mentioned previously, these are just um, some of the key sources for that conversation. And these were not notable players in, in Africa, Iroko TV, be before uh, Canal Plus um, went in there to pick up um, the, the Rock Studios, which was a spin-off of Iroko TV. Supremacy Sounds is a streaming is a streaming service, music streaming service. There are so many of those on SoundCloud. Um, it's based in Kenya. Uh, DJ Simple Simon is based in Kenya, and it's, it's global. What he churns out is local contents and puts them. Uh, needless to add that uh, the South African hits by uh, Master KG, Jerusalem, everybody knows it. It's, 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 it's the now Gangnam style uh, emerging from Africa. Um, for music, I'll just move on there. I think I'm running out of time. Right, so this is something I, I picked up from um, the, the, the campus of, at the University of Ghana in January, 2020. Um, they, they had their games, uh, they, they, they had the inter-university games, uh, and that book was actually on the field. It caught my eye. I took a photo of it and I looked at it, and you can see that this is powerful arts. Then they had a craft market, craft market that they tend to do on campus, and sometimes you find um, even students participating in, in some of these uh, crafts, exhibitions, and, and you name it. And it's all about local content. Now, if you actually go there, pick up uh, what, one or two of these items legitimately, and, and come back to the UK and decorate your homes, that, that is fine. No, no one's going to start talking about restitution per se. So that's something that I found quite interesting. So still on the elements of, um, of, of music, uh, one of the articles I published uh, on Afrobeats, and of course, High Life, um, being reinvented by, by the current artists from, from what used to be uh, the, the, the key music sound system of the 60s and 70s. And of course, uh, yes, here talking about diaspora engagement, where you find um, uh, London-based DJs of Nigerian origin actually playing their Afro beats. Um, being part of the, the showcase for artists coming from Africa uh, to, to sell out venues in London. And of course, bringing those local beats to an international sort of audience. Again, they are on individual basis. And now this is interesting because I picked up this uh, from, from uh, a journalist, David Ndeje, uh, one of my contacts on LinkedIn. He tends to write a lot. He's, he's based in Nairobi in Kenya. And he, he hits very important things. I think I had about two posts before I wrap, wrap up uh, on what David actually picks up. Because he's a journalist, he picks up on, on some of these key things. He's talking about royalties. You can see that the Kenyan government is actually coming in to step into protecting, protecting the intellectual property of creatives. How much of that is going on on that particular continent? Right, so uh, uh, this is movie. I don't think this gentleman needs any introduction, Star Wars, uh, John Boyega. Uh, this was in 2018, I think. I don't know how far he has gone with that, but investments in Nigerian movie industry by somebody of, Hollywood stature and status. And that's something that's quite interesting. It's just food for thought for now. Then when it comes to digital publishing and publishing in general, uh, there's been this conversation that uh, uh, African, African universities or, 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 or the African youth or, or you name it, uh, tend to consume a lot of um, foreign, foreign publishing yeah, without having any sort of domestic publishing. And that is, is an interesting conversation because that narrative is changing. There have been so many artists, but you, you can count them on, 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 on your fingers. When you start mentioning the likes of Chino Achebe, uh, Wole Shoika, and uh, Chimamanda Adichie, and the rest of them, uh, and, and a couple of others have started coming up with uh, scholarly publishing as well. But how about the publishing houses? Now, that's something that is quite interesting to think in terms of, I came across this particular article by Malthouse Press Limited, a uh, small publisher in, in, in Nigeria. And I did a review of that book, very interesting book Sony, by Sonny Oti, who is a musician or was a musician. 
and started that movement, uh, part of the, the front, front runners of high life. So I published in a book review in 2017, and I continued to dip into it to understand the trajectory, the journey, and of course, the, the reassembly of what was. And this is another interesting one where you begin to find some collaborations and mergers and acquisitions and strategic alliances. Now, these were the big two, IHOP in Kenya, and of course, CC Hub in Nigeria, co-creation hub for creatives. So Nigeria's uh, co-creative hub acquires Kenya's IHOP. You can begin to see that, that was um, September, 2019, uh, under two years ago. Some of the key things that are happening in that particular space. And now this, this is quite recent. And the same David Indeje that I told you about, uh, the founder of Kusoko, uh, the journalist. Now we, we, we're, we're talking about after, and um, we, we see many African countries having uh, two aside, two aside uh, pep talks and, 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 and striking deals. And you begin to wonder how that actually aligns with the ratification of the AFTA agreements. And this is where I draw to a close in terms of uh, gathering the evidence against yeah. AFTA or possibly challenging AFTA to give a response on what all this means for that particular sector beyond trade in fiscal goods. Thank you. And thank you very much. Uh, to the force there from Namdi. Um, I'm not sure if it'll be found. DJ Simon ever mentioned at the Institute of Commonwealth Studies before, but here we have it today. Um, but a range of, of, you know, very dynamic sector clearly growing um, and really highlights the point about it being a global industry. And I mean, it, 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 remember, um, Director General Ngozi told Tio talking very emphatically about trade being for people um, and, and is about people and clearly that very come across very strongly from the creative industry. So um, I understand we need to finish in 10 minutes. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to, um, uh, I've seen there's been questions asked in chat. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull them together. If you have questions you would like to ask, um, I'll let you come in, but I'm just going to, for the sake of the um, um, panel, I mean, in the interest of time, probably just give you a chance to um, or give a response to this or whoever wants to come in on this. But there are two specific points. I think one was um, Karishma, a question from um, Dr. Nicholas Watt, um, also one of our um, community at the Institute of Commonwealth Studies, one of the, the research fellows, asked about the low trust in consumers um, and I ask you to elaborate a bit on that. So I'll, I'll serve up the questions um, a bit as uh, like a sort of smorgasbord, then you can choose what you'd like from them. Um, there was also a question from um, Lucy Slack, the um, Deputy um, Director General of the, um, of the Commonwealth Local Government Forum. Um, um, and she talked about the role of cities and local government in ensuring an, an, an enabling environment for trade investment, but also, and this was talked about, I think, by Frank a bit as well, in developing value change and supporting small businesses that are key to undermining trade. And how can we better link, she's asking better, how can we better link local actors into domestic and international trade negotiations? I think this is also a theme that um, that Namdi was also highlighting in terms of how, how to link into, into um, into artists as well, um, and uh, not just, of course, in the region, but indeed also in the diaspora. Um, and then I think there was also, uh, I know that she's, um, uh, Abby Kadir has asked a question about, um, to Frank, about um, saying something about the impact of Africa on informal cross-border trade in East Africa or in Africa in general. Um, and I'm just having a quick look to see any other further questions here. A question about, um, for, um, Dr. Medici, so I think you've all got something you can respond to. A question to you all the way from Nairobi, from uh, Nana Wanjiao, who's the Chief Operating Officer for the Commonwealth Business Women's Network. In terms of piracy, how is the data looking like and the effects on artists as well as Nigeria's national GDP? And in fact, Nana um, and her team at the Commonwealth Business Women's Network were, ran a pilot for the first um, ever electronic marketplace led by women in the Commonwealth, which took place um, end of last year, linking six Commonwealth countries. And they're looking to broaden this out to many more during the, um, uh, in the lead up to Chogum 
um, uh, later um, in, um, in well, two, two or three months from now. So a range of questions there. Um, so there's one for Frank, one for Krishma, one from Namdi. Brendan, you may want to pick up on anything more broadly. Um, I'm just going to give anybody in the audience, because of the time, it's now um, 1738. So I'll probably just give the panel an opportunity to both respond to the question and then maybe also combine that with a closing comment from you. Um, I know um, it's uh, uh, dinner time is waiting, Frank, for you and for all of us as well. So we won't delay you more than another six or seven minutes. Um, and then okay. the, 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 those of us who need to, we might get, get, get a bit of a fresh air. Um, but before <laughs> I, I come to all of you, any more questions from anybody in the audience? Because we're not going to have a chance to come back to anybody else. Um, one more question, okay, um, which you may want to pick up on as well, either Frank or maybe Brendan. How do African counties balance the need to generate revenues and the growth of the of e-commerce because of the um, Kenya's recent introduction of the digital services tax uh, you may want to pick up on. So you've got a range of questions there. Um, I'll leave it to you. Um, let me go around maybe to, um, um, in, in, a, in the order in which you spoke this afternoon, perhaps I'll go to Brendan first and invite you, Brendan, to respond to any of those and to um, also make a closing a closing comment and then we'll, we'll finish off in about another five or six minutes. Brendan. Uh, thanks, Arif. I think it's been a fantastic discussion. Um, just a couple of things that jumped out as well. I, I, I really enjoyed the presentation on the creative industries in Africa. Yeah, um, uh, and something that sprung to mind is that this is thriving irrespective of the African continental free yeah. trade agreement. So the question that comes to mind is what is the value add? How does a, uh, an agreement that is supposed to ease uh, tariffs but also promote services um, come into play and what can be done. But I think it was also a fantastic um, demonstration of how the services industry meets the digital economy. Um, and, I, and I really enjoyed that. It was a tour de force, as, as Arif said. Um, I think it's really important how um, cities can contribute to uh, you know, the development of trade policy, the enabling environment. Uh, I think you know, cities have been really great at the promotional side, um, uh, promoting as is, but how do they come into the decision making and shaping the, you know, the, the, the investment environment, the innovation, uh, clustering, uh, urban centers, particularly are the sites of where, you know, transport and manufacturing and services and digital all meet, particularly in Africa. So I guess the starting point uh, is just that, uh, you know, particularly business needs to be organized at the local level. And that requires then a public private partnership with local government to try to advocate for those interests. Um, Lucy will pick up much more of this um, going forward. Thank you. Thanks, Brendan. Frank. Oh. Yeah, Frank, you want to come in next? Yeah. Okay, yeah, no, well, you know, I, I completely uh, echo everything. I, I really enjoyed all of the discussions and I, I thought I learned a lot uh, as well, Karishma, on, on what you were saying. Um, but I, I, I think the creative industries one is really interesting and it's actually one that we're doing a bit of work on, by the way, Professor. So, Namdi, we should probably connect sometime. But yeah, to answer the questions, the impact on the CFTA on informal traders, yeah, um, I, I think probably within EAC, not, not a massive uh, change for them because they're using the EAC Customs Union Protocol. However, for smaller businesses that are, and when I talk about informal traders, uh, one of my colleagues, Gloria, is on, on, on the chat, so she can say a bit more in the chat. She specializes in the work on women in trade. But we do a lot with informal cross-border traders. I think we've reached now about 80,000 in terms of uh, supporting them with their rights, you know, um, linking up with microfinance training and, and wider markets. I think it's a small enterprise segment that um, would have much more potential to move goods over longer distances and therefore utilize it, the CFTA. Um, it may also be in border areas where you've got some countries that are part of one trade regime um, to another that, you know, they don't have formal trade agreements with. But um, I, I think we have to think about those many, many millions of traders mm. and their voice actually needs to be heard in this trade agreement. Yeah. Um, and it's one of the things that we've tried to help. But maybe just because of time leave it there, the, the, the local government actors. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the main ways that some of these folks can get into the trade negotiations is through the private sector lens mm. of the chambers of commerce. Um, and I know that they are really putting inputs in. I know KEBSA here in Kenya, East African Business Council, Commonwealth Business Council, you know, there, there are a lot of, and the COMESA, um, COMESA Business Council, they've all had input. So I think through the private sector route and through associations, but clearly also linking up through the, the different county architecture. 
Um, and I think this point about revenue, maybe Karishma, you would, you would want to say more, but I think there is a lot of fear about revenue loss. But what's interesting is we've seen that a lot um, with, for example, here in East Africa, where there's a lot of fear when Rwanda, Burundi joined, or even when the actual customs even got off the ground. What effect did it have on revenues? Not much, not much. And it's quite interesting. But as, as to the actual sort of tra- uh, tax on digital, I think Krishna is probably in a better position. But it is something that I've discussed with Kenya Revenue Authority and um, the revenue authorities here, they really feel that they, they need to look at this. So last comment, I mean, I think um, let's make the continental free trade um, agreement and area really happen, right? And, and this will... This will mean concerted effort on all our, our, our parts, uh, particularly in terms of making sure that people can use this agreement from a creative industry perspective or a trade in goods perspective or trade in services. I think it's really important and it's beyond the trade agreement itself, more down to the trade facilitation. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Thank you very much for that. Karishma. Uh, yeah. Just very quickly on the point, I think, around uh, consumer protection and digital trust, I think. So we've included this in the report as well, a number of recommendations or proposed solutions around this. Um, So one of them was looking at this trust mark idea, which is sort of like these electronic badges, which uh, companies and like the e-commerce platforms put on their website. So that's just sort of to say, you know, that uh, providing a proof for the authenticity of the seller. And I think South Africa is already uh, doing this using, I think, European shop as a trust mark. Um, sometimes they also engage in payment providers, um, and sometimes they also act as um, sort of dispute resolution, an alternative dispute resolution mechanism. So I think that's uh, one you know, interesting idea to explore further. The other one, I think, uh, which was mentioned before, is also getting some more clarity on the rules of origin. I think that is also pretty uh, crucial. So, um, you know, making it clear whether the products are sort of African made or imported from a non AU country or actually um, they're, you know, imported from different countries and then assembled by a local manufacturer. So, um, you know, that labeling, I think, uh, around rules of origin can also help facilitate uh, more digital trust in the economy. Um, and then more broadly, I think, you know, as I said, it relates a lot to issues around uh, competition as well. Um, you know, uh, so the competition protocol of the EFC, FDA, um, also then needs to go beyond the traditional, you know, competition and predatory policies um, and also start looking at, you know, the digital landscape and how do you tax sort of these um, big digital giants. Um, and I think uh, the one point was around uh, the point around local actors. So I think that's actually very, very critical. Uh, so from whatever research we've done in the last few years, uh, one key gap there is looking at the political economy of digitalization. Um, And that's something I've just worked on very briefly, uh, currently uh, looking at that. Uh, So trying to understand which are the marginalized groups, um, you know, how are they being um, affected and whose voices are really being counted when we look at digital trade negotiations. Um, And, you know, is there a sort of a window of opportunity or change now given COVID and, uh, you know, so looking at civil societies, women institutions, uh, MSMEs and how they can really fit in. Uh, into these uh, negotiations uh, landscapes. So I think that's a very important uh, point as well. And uh, lastly, I think on the point around digital services taxation. So I think that's that's key, like balancing that, right? Uh, getting the taxation right, but at the same time, um, having a balanced approach so as to not sort of, um, uh, you know, bury the domestic digital industry. So a number of countries actually have put in, you know, started thinking this through uh, within Africa as well. So you have the Kenya digital services right. tax taxes and you also have the Uganda uh, services taxing. Thanks, Chris. But I think we just have, have to finish off in a minute or two at the most. So, Namdi, can I ask you just to very quickly, um, um, just in a few seconds, just to respond? Namdi? Oh, can you hear me? Yep. Right. Uh, my question was about uh, intellectual property, I think. Um, what was that? Yes, I think the jury is still out on that because yeah. um, that's something that's quite interesting. Um, how do you actually protect what, what you know very little about? Okay. Um, so that's a major challenge. Um, I was just having a conversation with um, somebody in the know in terms of uh, mm. uh, copyrights, especially music artists. And apparently I realized that uh, one of the hit songs by James Brown, in, in James Brown in, in the United States in the 70s has, was actually contained high life, local content that was, that was produced in, in, by, by an artist in Nigeria in the 60s. 
So uh, who's, who's going after, after the royalty in that sort of a space? I'll just leave you at that. And if, if that's something uh, yeah. that makes sense at the stage. Great. Um, so now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to, we, I, I need to bring, bring it together now. So I've just been advised. So what, what I'll do is I just want to thank you, Namdi, for that, but also thank all of you. Um, um, Brendan, uh, great to see an alumnus back at the Institute. Um, always uh, um, welcome to see that. And uh, thank you so much, Brendan, for giving that rich um, context, for Frank, for building on that with some real evidence and examples from the ground, Charisma for bringing home the importance of the digital economy, and Namdi to bring it all together through the creative industries. Um, I'll pass back to Philip to formally close the meeting. Philip. Arif, thank you so much for, uh, for chairing. And uh, it's been a fantastic discussion, incredibly rich discussion. And again, an, an example of um, what, what we've gained from using this digital technology to connect people uh, around the world. Um, but, and, and great to see, uh, great to see an old uh, uh, ICWS alumnus back. Um, uh, Brendan, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Frank. Uh, thank you, Karishma. Uh, thank you, Namdi. It's, it's been a, a great discussion. Um, we will be um, online again uh, on Thursday afternoon uh, talking about the Ugandan elections uh, with a, an expert panel, um, uh, including, including Bobby Wine, I can announce today. Um, so that should be an interesting, interesting discussion. And, um, but, but thank you Ari, for, for organizing this. Thank you all for attending and um, keep an eye on our events program because uh, we have some very interesting seminars coming up uh, in, the rest of the, in the rest of the year. So thank you all so much. Uh, have a good evening. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.